to Changing the Sales Game on webtalkradio.com. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. You know, I'm happy that you're here. Now, I hope weekly as you listen to the show that, of course, number one, you feel my passion that changing the sales game is real important. And I also understand that typically when we hear that word sales, especially if sales isn't our full-time job, it's a portion of our job, that word sales can throw us and kind of come to that icky conclusion that I'm being pushy. So to help you on your journey to change your sales game, please take my free communication style assessment. I think it's a pretty powerful tool, which will help you understand your natural communication superpowers what that means is you'll understand how people are receiving your message. Very important, especially in sales. The second piece, you will get uh, your lowest score or your blind spots as it relates to communication, which sometimes I think is even more powerful than understanding our superpowers. So in the show notes, you will see my free communication style assessment. It's my gift to you. I truly do hope it helps you navigate um, your navigating sales in your career. Now, my motivational quote, so we set the tone for today's topic, is by General Colin Powell, and he says, great leaders are almost always great simplifiers who can cut through argument, debate, and doubt to offer a solution everybody can understand. Now, I found that simple strategy actually works best, especially when it comes to our sales activity. Now, early in my career, when my sales managers, well, let me just put it this way, all my sales managers weren't the best of leaders. I've also found that successful salespeople don't always make great sales leaders. And it's because there's two very different skills that go into those different roles. So how does someone who is leading a sales team help their team um, sales skill grow? Very important question. And of course, I have an expert today to help us with that. So my guest is Alan. I'm going to let Alan say his last name. He is an engineer turned sales expert, and he uses his analytical skills to reverse engineer sales success. He co-founded Growth Matters to develop sales managers globally after realizing their crucial role in sustainable sales growth. Now, with over 2,000 managers developed in 45 countries, Alan believes companies should prioritize manager manager development over enablement training. Alan speaks candidly with a lighthearted approach and, of course, great passion for sales. So, Alan, thanks so much for being on the show. Before we start, say your last name for me. In South Africa, it's Fristig, as if you're clearing out your throat. Most Americans (laughs) say Fristig, and the Dutch pronunciation, my original heritage, Fristig. So if is fine, for Stierch, if you're clearing your throat, not always an easy one. Most call me Ellen V, so it just keeps it easier. Ellen V, I love it. You got it, Alan. So tr- truly, thank you. It's late where you are, but I so appreciate you coming on because you, like me, we're, we nerd out on sales stuff. So today we're really going to focus on the sales management component, which to me is the backbone of sales success for any organization. So first question for you is how do you cultivate those high performing sales cultures? And you believe you can do that through the sales management discipline. How do you do that? Yeah, I think the key thing is that, you know, and why I appreciate your work on it is we, we got to rethink this and we've got to get back to what I call the sales fundamentals. You know, we speak a lot about, you know, sales relationships. We want sales relationships. And we know that if we can establish good relationships, we can be successful at selling. But the way I see sales relationships is it's, it's kind of like the, the meal we create. We need good ingredients and we need a good recipe. We're going to create that meal. You know, I'm going to create it differently to anyone else on this call. But I need those good you know, foundational ingredients and a, and a stable recipe or a sales process. If we look at your, um, your simple sales process, right? I read a process that guides us. And the challenge that I believe has happened is frontline managers that we had pre-CRM, were skilled in this. They were trained on coaching. They were trained on enabling disciplines in a business. Mm. And as a result, they could execute effectively. And unfortunately, not with any ill intent, we got we got starry-eyed about technology. And eventually we could measure so much that we didn't know what to do with it. And as a result, salespeople are coming into environments, and I mean you mentioned in your opening, where you weren't really working with a great sales manager, because great salespeople don't automatically become great sales managers. Right. But here's the key thing. Also, the other thing that technology can do is help us overcomplicate things, right? If you really think about it, and we get to the gist of things, you know, here's a simple sales fundamental. 
if you start with a noble intent to create value, everything else falls into place. Right? It's just one simple fundamental that we forget. But where I see the, the sales world struggling is everybody's working on the enablement train and nobody's laid the tracks of execution. Yeah. You know, if I look at your work on it, it's, it's the same thing. It's, you know, we're teaching people mechanisms and behaviors. I think one of your previous podcasts about behavior change, where co managers have lost that, that, that science and art of coaching and realizing that's the number one thing that drives performance change. And I'm going to pause there. But if the research says that the number one thing you can do, hands down, by far more than technology, more than training, more than consulting, more than anything, is effective sales manager coaching. It's the first thing we cancel in our calendar. The organizational culture doesn't support it. So salespeople are coming to this world, and I love, I forget the previous speaker's name, but what they said was, our role is not to grow sales. Our role is to grow salespeople who grow sales, right? And that's what sales managers are missing, is those execution disciplines, those fundamentals, what I call frameworks and processes that really give us an environment, a soil, that those sales seeds can thrive. And that's really the work I work on, is how do I help sales managers help salespeople do their number one job? And they have got to take care of the recipe and the ingredients, supporting the artistry of the salesperson, the personality. You know, and I took your assessment, everyone on the call, go do the assessment, right? And it's so eye-opening because once again, I go, yes, areas for improvement, there's areas of strength, but what does a manager do with it? And often it's nothing, you know, and, and that's really part of my passion for sales management. It's interesting because years ago, when I started my business 21 years ago, I came in, I did the training and that was it. And I didn't have what I call non-negotiables now, right? You live and learn as a business owner. So at first they would do the training. And then as soon as I walked away a year or two later, we trained everybody. We started to develop the culture within the organization and that framework, right? New as a business owner, I'm thinking, okay, I did my job. You don't really need me anymore, which is the, always the hope that then they could create their internal processes and continue where I left off. And then if you need a refresher down the road with new hires, easy peasy, come in, do what you do, but the structure is in place. And what I found, Alan, as soon as I'd leave, they'd backslide and it was as if I was never there. So this made me really uncomfortable because I thought, holy, holy smokes, that's my reputation. It's going to be said, well, Connie's training doesn't work. Where that wasn't the case when I left, we had everything locked and loaded and ready to go. So about two years into my business, I, I have non-negotiables. They have to use some kind of a communication model. Thus, I created my own about eight years ago. But prior to that, Myers-Briggs, Predictive Index, DISC, didn't care. They had to use something because we need tools to understand how do I communicate? Again, what are my superpowers? But I have blind spots with that. What do I need to work on? great tool and it's a tangible tool so the sales manager could come in and now help support and help me grow through action steps to improve my communication so that was the first thing the second thing whether they hire me to do the coaching or teach their managers how to coach the teams or they have another internal coaching mechanism i didn't care but there had to be non-negotiable if they didn't have a coaching program they had to determine one or bring me in to do that piece of it because you you like me we know learning happens after the training not in the training classroom so who's supporting that after and the answers I kept getting is, well, we don't have time for this. So, Alan, I walked away from business. I said, if you're not going to offer the coaching component, which is the strength of developing but sustaining a culture, sustaining the growth of your individuals, and sustaining the relationships with the client that are going to want to keep doing business with you, you need the coaching component. So I've walked away from business because I, it's my reputation, it's my business, and I, I can't allow someone else to damage that because they don't buy into that need for coaching. For me, coaching is the, is the backbone of what we're trying to create that out here and to keep it sustainable and functioning but with that that trajectory of growth, you know, over time. 100%. And it's, it's strange. It seems like a kindred story because where I started out was I bought the license for Neil Rackham's work, which was spin selling and had the license in Africa to take that forward. And it's a, it's a powerful methodology. You know, Neil Rackham, it's great work. But my frustration was I wasn't seeing the impact that I knew it could bring. And then we said, okay, there's a coaching challenge and there was the field guide. So then I do the coach, the coach, the coach, which was helping the managers. 
But what I started to see, Connie, and, and why I then stepped away and I said, wait a minute, I can't build a sustainable business until I can drive real impact, is that there isn't an organizational discipline of doing it. And that's really where the idea of growth matters and that business came about, is getting that right. And the other thing, and maybe you got some experience in this as well, Connie, is there's a confusion about what coaching is. Right? Now, the way I explain it to people is like, it's the difference between cannonball management and cruise missile management. Uh, I think it's a metaphor that Jason Jordan used in um, um, cracking the sales management code. But effectively, in, in cannonball management, we miss our target and everyone has an opinion, right? It's because the cannonball's too heavy or the weather conditions are right or the gunpowder's there or the operators are dense or engineer like me. It's because the brake force on the wheel can't handle the reverberation of the turret. That's obviously the answer. But the point is it's debate. And that debate rages in emails, it rages in meetings, and no one knows. But when you go to cruise missile management, the manager becomes the satellite. And in a cruise missile, we can measure and correct, measure and correct. That's why you're like your assessment tool and other assessment, like our coaching assessment tool. The only intent is to say, where are you and how can you improve along the journey? And when you strip away coaching, you remove the ability to get immediate feedback and learn. And I want you listeners, please listen to this quote. It comes from Peter Zengi in the fifth discipline. If the consequences of our actions are distant in time and space and they're linked unclear, we are very poor at learning. Hugh Selling. Because, Connie, it's not like you said one magical statement in your last meeting with a customer that they've chosen to go with you. It is a continuous communication. It's a continuous building of trust and rapport. It's a continuous journey. But if I can't connect the dots between what I did right and what I did wrong, I can't correct it. So managers, if you're listening to this, that is your responsibility. You ought to be the GPS, not the driver. You can't grab the steering wheel and show them the way. Coaching is that mechanism that scientifically drives behavior change. And the only caveat on that then, Connie, is don't confuse performance coaching with sales coaching, behavioral coaching. Because a lot of managers think coaching is this, Connie. It's, it's a model that says, where do you need to be? What's the gap of where you need to be? And what's the opportunity to improve it? Telling me what to do does not teach me how to do it. It does right. not grow my ability in the how, right? And that's the shift that's got to happen and why coaching is such a, one of the critical disciplines of sales managers. What do you see as a difference? That, that's I, I agree with what you just said. Now you said performance coaching models, they're destroying the sales co coaching piece of it. Where do you see that disconnect and how, are, how have you been able to fix that? So starting out, I think we've, we've adopted too much of an inspection culture and not an mm. improvement culture, right? Mm. So we say, you know, your job is not to grow sales, it's to grow salespeople who grow sales. But there's an inspection culture. So what tends to happen, because we need the data and we need the information and we need to report on something and we've got a KPI card or a balance scorecard we've got to fill out, the coaching becomes about where you are. So that's, that's performance. It's about the number. You need to be at 100. You're sitting at 80. Well, thank you for telling me what I already knew. Um, the opportunity is to do this. Why don't you go do these four things? Now, because I might be instinctively good at that or develop that skill over time, it doesn't mean that person buys into that behavior or knows how. It's no different watching someone cook. They're doing something and say, you just do this and you add a bit of this and you say, but how much is a bit? <laughs> right? How much specifically is that little bit? And that's performance coaching. It becomes too number oriented. Behavior right. coaching is saying, where's Ellen's gap? I mean, is Ellen's gap in pipeline health? Is Ellen's gap in deal management? Is Ellen's gap in uh, differentiation? Where does that sit? And then how do I coach Ellen, GPS Ellen, to his own conclusion about what to do? Because then I'm creating behavior change. I'm changing thinking. And that's the difference. Performance coaching tells me what I know and gives me part of the process. Wonderful. It's needed. But it doesn't change how I do. Behavioral coaching shifts behavior. And to, once again, I apologize for getting her name. But when she said, the, the thing is just work with the top 20%. You know, I fully agree with her that there's a whole bunch of sales potential. And I'm going to pause the economy and hope your audience doesn't leave. But I, I, I resonate with that because I got fired from my first four sales jobs. You know, I was, in, I was an electronic engineer. And it wasn't my fault. I watched Airwolf, Night Rider, and MacGyver. I thought that's what I was going to be. <laughs> and then I hated engineering. I hated it. Went into sales and I just couldn't work. And I followed all the advice. And as an engineer, I can't see a world that doesn't have cause and effect. I can't see a world where you're just born in a certain way. And that became my passion and my research. And exactly to that point is that under a good manager, I changed. When the manager changed, all of my potential got unlocked. And that's the power of behavioral coaching. With previous years, it was just telling me where I sucked, why I sucked, and what I need to do not to suck. And then fired me when I couldn't fix it, right? And that's not growing people. 
Well, it's funny because the you're right. The performance coaching is about numbers. You're here. You need to get there. Go make more phone calls. Meanwhile, I'm apprehensive on the phone because I don't have my rhythm or whatever it is. So now instead of making, I'm just picking a number, 25 calls a day that I already suck at. Um, that's not my jam. I'm better live at networking, but I know I have to make those calls because you told me I have to make 25 calls. So now during my coaching, you say, well, okay, the 25 didn't work. Let's bump it up to 50, double the call effort, right? Double the number. Meanwhile, I sucked at 25. I'm going to suck worse at 50. And my confidence now, maybe I'm in the wrong job. Maybe I, I do well live, but I know the phone is a piece. So now the negative record player goes into hyper gear because you're telling me you're the boss, right? I'm reporting reporting to you. And I'm thinking, well, clearly 50 phone calls should work, but it's not working. I don't know what I'm doing, right? That whole dynamic starts to unfold and we lose confidence. And then what happens? We either walk away, we look for another job. And then if we have another bad coach in that job, now we really, we've reinforced, I guess I really suck at this. Maybe I need to go and find another job. So we, we it becomes this death spiral that we can't stop to change because we're looking at the wrong things. We're trying to manage a number instead of the human and their potential of changing a smidge of a behavior and then another smidge, right? You stack that other smidge of a behavior and you keep stacking. Now, all of a sudden, I'm a rock star salesperson because I had the right person helping me behaviorally, not telling me what my numbers are, right? So I 100% agree. And having another lens of it, you're also saying to them, go suck in front of more customers, go <laughs> piss off more customers, go and reinforce this negative Hollywood perception of sales professional. Let's just go reinforce that. And, yes. and that's a completely flawed approach because it's skills multiplied by the number of time we use those skills, multiplied by where we allocate those skills, multiplied by the process we use. And I call it SNAP, but most companies only look at N. They look at the numbers. And, and that doesn't help me, you know? And I, I have a lot, had a lot of potential in me. I, I, I know that. I know I still do. But it's finding those, those managers they don't, and you can't make time. You can only take time and protect them. They right. prioritize coaching as the job they're hired to do. And I'll argue this, Connie, but a lot of organizations then derail that because they don't create a culture that supports that. And the other thing, coming back to your example, the second lens of it is because of that insecurity, because of that fear, I revert to, to, to digital tactics. And what I mean by that is if you have the right fundamentals, social selling works well for you. If you have the right fundamentals, email marketing is an extension of your voice. If you have the right, all of these things, you know, that, that people speak about on your podcast are so relevant. But when we're insecure, we hide behind the mouse. And the reality is the problem isn't the communication method, you know, verbal, written, digital. The challenge is I haven't been coached in a fundamental. And, and that's what we lose. And we can't just assume we're going to pull people off the street and they're going to be these magical sales professionals. It is a highly complex profession, as you know, because the complexity of communication, you know, human communication is complex. Yet we just think, hey, let me just tell them what to do and they'll get it done. And I, I think if I had to put it in a sentence, we have a production line mentality about sales yes. that is damaging the profession. Yeah, it's funny you say that because when I teach coaching, right, to the managers, executives, whoever it is that's going to support whatever the training is after the fact for these sales folks, I, well, I tell them, okay, <laughs> you keep telling them the same thing, but if that's not the core problem or the core issue or the core skill, you're, you're telling them to learn product knowledge. Meanwhile, they know the product knowledge, product knowledge inside out. It's that they're apprehensive on the phone, or maybe the way they're writing is not congruent with how they're speaking and how they're showing up. So there's other disconnects, but you keep going to, for your own limitations, or because you're unsure how to coach, go and learn product knowledge. So we're, we're telling Telling people what to do, we're not showing is another one. We're not helping people create many action steps. I believe in giving people many successes because then what happens? Our confidence goes up. Time, we go, yeah. give me more, give me more, right? I want more. And now they go up that learning curve and that trajectory because they're buying in, they're feeling good. This feels good. Connie gets me, she's helping me, that everything gets exponentially faster. And the other thing I was going to say, um, when you're, you're an engineer. So you think from that very um, systematic kind of approach. It's how your brain is wired. And I remember when I started my business 21 years ago and I thought, all right, I'm going to teach people how to sell. 
And uh, this is the truth, Alan, I sat there and I thought, well, I'm successful. Why? What do I do? What are the skills that I literally bring to the table? And can I duplicate my process, number one? And can I teach what I do? Can I show and explain and give examples and work with people to show them exactly what to do to build their own skill with their own voice, their own, I fire fast, you fire fast. Some salespeople have a calmer demeanor. Don't try to be like me. How could you be like you? But what are the skills you need to develop? So I literally sat there for, for a few days and I started to write out, what do I do? How do I do it? And after, after doing that, I came up with, I realized that over and over and over again, I did the same seven step process and I just simplified it to those seven steps. And that goes back to my quote to start the show. If you have a simple process that's understandable and achievable, now then you could make it more complicated, bring numbers in and reports and all that stuff. But if you keep that initial behavior growth simple, people understand what that next baby step is. We're, we're, we're rushing to the finish line and that's why we're telling versus showing and allowing people to do the muscle memory, right? To learn, like you say, the fundamentals, the fundamentals work and we forget. And then, and one last thing I wanna say about coaching. You know, you have professional baseball and athletes out there and I'll just use Tiger Woods, right? Golfer, one of the best golfers known around the world. Okay. I'm not a golfer, but I do know who Tiger Woods is. So clearly he's, he's pretty good. He has a coach as he walks the green and he goes through whatever the, uh, the holes are. He has a coach with him. And after you see them walking and talking and the coach is he's a professional. This guy knows what he's doing. And his coach is saying, turn your hands at, eighth of an inch this way, or your posture was this way. It's those microscopic changes. So even these professional experts need coaching. So it's, it's real. What we're talking about is real and the fundamentals work. And we have to keep focusing on that. I think that's the key thing. And, and, and while I've been on your show is, you know, I think the word we've, we've lost is also, it's got to be pragmatic, right? So, yeah. you know, I, I, I can easily over-engineer anything, but you started with a quote that real leadership is simply fine. You know, and, and what we do is we, you know, we work sales managers. He has a discipline of nurturing pipeline health. But if I speak to 99 sales managers, they all have a different definition of pipeline health. So let's simplify that. It's four things. You have to have values. You got to have cover. You got to have volume. You have to have enough deals. You have to have velocity. You have to have movements, and you have to have a healthy shape because otherwise you hit the number this quarter and fall off a cliff next one. That's right. So now we're a framework. What's the process? Well, we're going to set the rules. We're going to sanitize the data. We've got to coach the gap, and we're going to do um, the development area. Now, it's pragmatic. And the reality is that when it's that simple, people go, can't be that simple. But where it happens and where it falls apart is even with a great process, as you know yours, your process didn't make people like you. Your process was built on top, what I believe your, your recipe was built on top of ingredients of who Connie is, right? And there's amazing research behind this. The number one thing customers value in salespeople are their values. And you said something just now, that, well, the first value is authenticity, meaning, if I'm so busy trying to be someone I'm not, I can't pay attention to the customer's needs. Right? When I'm authentic in my intent, which is the second one, client centricity. I don't know if you've read the book, Lisa McLeod, Selling with Noble Purpose. Wonderful book and be a great guest for your show. But Selling with Noble Purpose. When we have that intent, we don't have to worry so much about body language. We don't have to worry because it, it's expressed naturally as our intention. So who Connie is, is part of the, 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 the ingredients and what we do as managers is we have to hire for those ingredients, coach on those ingredients, guide them in the process, and then relationships and skills and sales will be developed. But if we're so busy sitting behind an Excel table or a pivot table or a, an a exception report on our CRM system, how are we developing salespeople? And, and the research is there. The number one lever you can pull to improve a sales organization's performance is the sales manager. And 99% of organizations take high-performing salespeople promote them into sales management without a process in place to educate them how to be good at their profession. And it is a complex profession. You start with this. It is a completely different mindset. Um, I forget the book's name now, but it's called Sales Mindset. It explains the difference between the mindset of a sales manager and a salesperson. And that's the void we kind of stepped in to help with because I could see that driving that traction. And as you said, the non-negotiable. When companies come to say, look, we want to work with the salespeople going, we don't work with them unless we work with your managers because otherwise it's not going to get to where it needs to get to. Like you said, unless I'm coaching them, unless they're being coached, unless they have a communication framework, 
what I do is not going to have the traction and that's going to put me in a bad light. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, you know, for me, Alan, I don't want a paycheck if I'm not making a difference. Like it matters to me. So yeah, I work great. Right, Cause we have to work. We have bills to pay. You know, I had to put kids through college all like everybody else. We're all the same, but I don't want to get paid if I'm not making a difference at the end of the day. So if my process isn't working, you shouldn't pay me. It's not, it, it doesn't work. And I just want to comment on the values piece. Last week or this past week, I was up in New Hampshire. I have a, a client, Ledyard Bank, shout out to them, great people. And I, it was funny because the last time I was up there a few weeks ago, I had trained three days. As I'm aging, when I started my business at 39, I could train five days a week and be in front of people and bring the energy. I didn't get fatigued. Well, as I'm aging, I'm finding that three days of doing live, intense, you know, seven hours, you know, on my feet, talking and, and thinking, it gets fatiguing. Well, we're driving home and then it's so it's training all day and then it's a six hour ride home. And so the last time my husband was, comes with me because we go on adventures and we investigate new areas. And we're driving home and he looked at me and he goes, who are you? I said, why? What's the matter? And he goes, your energy, you're talking. He goes, I thought you were going to fall asleep five minutes, you know, into the ride. And I said, you know, it's funny. This is such the perfect client for me. And he's like, oh, why? I said, values, our values are so, my values, my philosophies of business and people and good sales, right? And, and building that dynamic relationship-based culture, but living and breathing it they they're the same so i said it was such easy training because the receptivity the stories they shared back to me you can build and leverage and say yes now how can we do more of that but they were already living it we're just we're just raising the volume of what they're already doing in their marketplace so how easy and beautiful that is for me plus they're trusting my recommendations they're trusting the training right it energized me instead of exhausting me. That's important. It's the same thing with the sales manager. The values of the organization, the values of the sales manager, the values of the salesperson, they have to be in alignment. Otherwise, we're, we're disconnected and we're not going to be able to perform at the highest level for ourselves, for our team or the sales manager, but ultimately for the organization. I mean, and, and I hope the audience hears their punchline, right? because value alignment is so critical in that sales space. Yeah. And there's a guy by the name of Philip Squire wrote a book called Sales Transformed, and he's done a lot of research on this space. But if we think about it practically, and you interview a customer and say, why didn't you buy from this person? They're not going to speak about closing techniques. They're not going to speak about communication styles. They're, not going to, they're going to be speaking about something that they didn't value. They're going to say, there's something about them that just was off. There's something that was just not authentic. They didn't seem to be customer focused. They didn't challenge us enough. They weren't creative in solutions. They're going to be talking about values based things. They're going to be talking about those fundamentals. And that's why I, I love the work you do, Connie, because it's your process is built on who you are. And a lot of your podcasts are about reinforcing. I don't want that sleazy view. And that's the risk, right? Technology is not going to scale this easy salesperson because they can go into chat GPT, they can put in a few words and sound like they're an expert, but it's also going to scale the truly the true sales professionals that are there to sell with noble purpose, create value for the market, and help customers. You know, and I have this mindset as a salesperson myself that says it would be borderline negligent for me to deny this customer the value I can bring. And just that mindset, just that value changes my whole game. Because when I'm feeling a little bit nervous about a proactive sales call, I'm feeling a bit nervous about a first meeting of it, I go, wait a minute, let's just revert back to who you are. You yeah, with all the right intentions. And what I love about it, just you know, your, your podcast name and intent is let's change the fact that we're not what most of Hollywood perceives us to be. You know, we, we're more pursuits of happiness than we are Wolf of Wall Street. And the world needs to see this in our, in our, in our behavior. And that's what's so important to get that out. But sales managers and sales leaders, you're part of that. Because sales leaders, you can't keep telling your salespeople to be customer-centric and all you measure is what matters internally. Sales managers, you can't tell them to be relationship builders when nothing you measure in your CRM system is about a relationship. That's right. you you got to realize we we set the culture. And if you don't take care of the soil, the soil, we can't blame the seeds. We can't go, oh, but they're just bad people. And then lastly, one thing you did say that I want to just go back to is you said, you know, if managers aren't seeing this change in people and they keep asking them, I always say to sales managers, if you're experiencing a groundhog day with your people, you need to go look in the mirror because it's your responsibility. You got to realize that you keep telling them to do the same things, but you're not coaching them to see the value of it. You're not coaching them to learn the how. You're not working on those nuances. 
And the other thing you said that you that really makes a difference to sales managers, Connie, is when their desire is to improve and grow people, they, they are always the top performing sales manager. They always grow the most people. They always have the greatest impact. And they change family trees. My sales manager, that took me from being fired four times to being a highly successful sales professional. He was that he was that catalyst because he had that ability to unlock that. And I, I want that to be heard because we can keep complaining about salespeople are too transactional and they're not adding value and they're not building relationships and, and then telling them what to do. Just go build relationships. Just go build rapport. Okay, they're great. How do I do that if I don't have the means? Coach me, help me, guide me. But no, we're too busy doing a, a KPI performance review that doesn't actually change anything. You know, I keep telling people, if you see an Excel spreadsheet table and you change a number and you see human behavior change, phone me because then that's going to be an anomaly. <laughs> Right. Behavior doesn't change on a spreadsheet or on a, on a technology. Yeah, it, it's through sales managers. And, and we're, we're out of time, but I, I do want to comment. You use the word noble. I really believe that sales is a noble business when we say I'm a sales professional, because in my heart, I am here to help people find their solution. There's no cookie cutter, right? Everybody is different. Everybody's got their own little secret sauce, if you will. So you and I, we can give processes and we could ground it so that they can see what behavior, you know, what, uh, what am I observing? What should I be observing? We can teach that to sales managers. So now they know what to look for and then how to make those changes in behavior. Forget about the numbers, right? Look at the human. What are they doing? Well, let's build on that. Where are they glitching out a little bit? Probably a blind spot. They don't even know they're glitching out. As soon as you shine a light, you give them some action steps on how to fix it. Magic starts happening. But it's it's such a noble profession. And, and you know, dealing, like I said, I was with my bank, one of my banks this week. And I said to them, do you realize the responsibility you have? Health for humans is our most important thing, because if we're not healthy, you're, you're good for nothing, right? We can't earn money. We can't protect our family or take care of family, et cetera. Money is the next important thing for humans, because if we show up and we work, now we can put roof over our head, food on the table. Financial professionals, I said, when you're not sharing and teaching the younger kids how to save for retirement, why they should save for retirement, right? Really giving them the discipline of financial uh, success, right? Or, or financial um, uh, knowledge. I said, it's a disservice. How dare you not be responsible? You're doing financial malpractice by saying, oh, they want to check an account or, oh, they want a mutual fund, but you're not digging deeper. Shame on you. This is our responsibility with the zone of genius we've been given. It, it, it's honorable for you to sell and share and teach your clients and build those relationships. That's the other I mean, thing I, I see word, missing. Honorable. I mean, honorable is such a powerful word, right? Oh. I, I was saying, you know, uh, uh, it, selling won't help, but helping will sell, right? And, and when we have that mindset change, and that's what, you know, changing the sales game is about, understanding that we fulfill a purpose of helping educate people out of their own ignorance of how they can add value to a market, to a place, to people. And what was interesting for me was, you know, just in closing, listening to your podcast about when, when COVID hit and you're like, okay, wait a minute, I built a business for 20 years, now what? And you said, oh, you know, I felt like vomiting. And then I listened to a podcast and you thought, I've got to hire this person. And this is the thing. When we have a, a, a honorable, noble purpose greater than us, we don't let those glitches stop us. So for me, it was what I'm going to do with this, what I'm going to do with my business. You know, I, I had 22 city trips booked for 2022. I was excited to go to all of them and it, it, it was gone. And I sat there, you know, moping for two or three days. And I said, wait a minute, I can't deny the market my value. And I just was saying, how can I make sure that I'm the most relevant Zoom call someone has this week? And that was my only design point. And everything I did, I started to prepare. I was the most prepared salesperson on my calls. I was engaging with international buyers. I was, but they would say to me, Alan, you need to just run a course on how people sell on, on Zoom. And I said, it's not, it's, the process changes, but guess what doesn't change? My sales fundamentals don't change. That's the right. core process, like your process doesn't change. The mechanics of it change. That's right. And if we've got a noble purpose, so that's the fundamentals, the, the, the ingredients, and I have a good recipe. I tweak the recipe because this, this family wants Italian, not they don't want, you know, a Greek meal. So I tweak it. And then you realize you actually can control more. And I think that's the challenge that what some technology has done is it's allowed managers and salespeople to wait for someone to guide them through the, through the desert. Yeah. And I'm going, when you have an honorable, noble purpose greater than just the revenue, the revenue takes care of itself every time. You know, that's the honeybee does not know it's saving the planet by pollinating flowers. Just going after the honey. 
And I say it the other way around. If we just if we just go after creating value for our customers, generally most things in sales fall together. Can you tweak your communication style? Yes. Can you be a better coach? Definitely. Can you? These are the enhancements of any profession. Is why we say doctors practice and lawyers practice because they never it's never finished. And in sales, it's a practice. We we never finish growing, and that's why you know podcasts and investing for the listeners on this right. Investing your growth is critical because it's a differentiator. Everyone else is waiting around hoping someone fixes the problem. And it's, it's personal, make it personal. It's your career ask. And if you don't find it, go and find it. Right. That's like you, you said in 2020, I had to go and find the resources of, cause I didn't know what I was missing. So I evaluated, evaluated, listened, learned, kept going. And then thought, ah, I found the person that I knew could help me move the needle. Cause he spoke to me and, and it was a skill. I was not digital. So that was a big uh, skill deficit for myself. My sales, I still had 40 years of experience. I just didn't know how to bring it online. I needed someone to teach me that. And that at my level of understanding, which I was tech not at the time, so <laughs> I was really low on that digital learning curve. Doesn't mean I'm not intelligent and I couldn't do it, but all my other stuff that was in my head and my experience, it's still there. It's just the delivery had to shift a little bit, right? Exactly. exactly. What happened was the, the, the tools you used to make the meal changed. You no longer had a, a stove, you had an air fryer, you no longer had this, you had that, but you still had the ingredients and the process to rely on. Right. And the problem is because people aren't, and managers aren't coaching those two things. When those changes come, everyone hits panic mode. They're supposed to go, I need someone to educate me on how to use the air fryer or how to use digital. But guess what? I'm still getting there because the fundamentals in place and the process in place. That's right. You know, and, and the core of that fundamental is who Connie is as a person and how she sees the profession of sales. Yeah. And if managers aren't hiring for that and developing that, we're missing a massive change in the sales game. Yeah, agree. Well said. Listen, everyone, I all think you need more Alan in your life. So go to his website, which is Growth Matters, and then it's INTL, abbreviation for international. So Growth Matters, INTL.com. I will put it in the show link. If you have a question specifically for Alan, please reach out to him. He is sharing his email address. It's Alan V at growthmattersintl.com. And you do have a free gift, which I'll put the link in the show note, Alan. Can you just tell everybody what that is? So effectively, it's a practical sales coaching assessment. So as earlier you were saying, Alan, do, do I really understand the difference between performance coaching and behavior coaching? What if I think what I'm doing is coaching that's actually not coaching? Mm -hmm. This is a quick synopsis that says, there's four areas you want to be working on, how you're doing and what are the opportunities to improve? Perfecto. Perfecto. Everybody needs to download that. That's that's great. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for being on. And we really do have to change this sales game out there. And I'm on a mission, one person at a time, that if we truly can always come from that love, care, and respect. For me, that's the big word with sales. We have to be respectful of the people in front of us and then honor them, but honor our own knowledge and bring it forward because it is our responsibility, right? It was Spider-Man. Uh, Uncle Ben says to Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. I really live and breathe that, Alan, because I think it is our responsibility so that everybody can earn and make a beautiful living doing it the right way. So it's always going back to those basics, values, a nobleism, all of the things that we talked about. So thank you so much for being on and just a great conversation. I hope, I know, I shouldn't say, I hope I know everyone listening found value in this. So thank you again. Yeah, no, thank you too. And uh, you know, just to those managers as well, you get the power, you get the responsibility, right? Focus on growing sales, people who grow sales. Don't just focus on growing sales. Absolutely. And uh, you'll see a phenomenal fulfillment that happens when you do that. So thank yeah. you for your time, Connie, and thanks to the listeners. Yeah, thank you. And again, we lead through people. Remember that we lead through people, not pushing them out of the way so we could do it for them. <laughs> thank you again, Alan. And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build, and discover together, no matter where you are in changing your sales game. I truly hope that my guests and I, our conversation, the resources, the tools, the ideas, the stories, I hope that you take it and put it into action. I know I end on this every week, but it's so important for you to hear me. Information is a beautiful thing. Being lifelong learners, beautiful thing. If you do nothing with the information you've learned, it becomes stagnant and it's not usable. 
put it into action. I promise you magic will happen on the back end. Thank you for tuning in to Changing the Sales Game with me, your host, Connie Whitman on webtalkradio.com. Truly wish you an inspired week. Please take one of the tips or ideas that Alan shared, apply them into your sales career, your sales coaching, and into your people. And just watch and see what happens and the harmony and love that you could create within your team. I wish you all an amazing week and I will see you next week. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great one, everybody. Oh, 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 oh,